Hi, good day everyone. Um, this is a part of my series on um, uh, mineral processing. So one of the first steps in the mineral processing flow sheet is actually um, mineral liberation. So in the light of that, the first point of, about mineral liberation is why is it important? Well, it's, it's actually basically what the word says, to liberate. In this case here, just a schematic diagram, let's say these are the sort of pieces that you're looking for and the gray is your gang. Liberation is really about getting these pieces that you're looking for free from the rest of the material so that physical separation processes like gravity, etc. can work on it, on, on the mineral particles. Um, th there is a difference between liberation and uh, just breakage. So sometimes you just want to break the particle smaller, and that's usually often for downstream handling, etc. But the main purpose of breaking the big rocks and making a small communition is to liberate the sort of the mineral species. So that's yeah, just a graphical illustration that there's sometimes just size reduction where you just you don't really care. You just want to make the stuff small enough. And incidentally, if you make the stuff small enough, by implication, you are going to liberate the minerals that you are looking for. Whereas liberation is really about breaking the rocks and only liberating the mineral species you want. And that's generally what you want to do because um, breaking rocks and making them smaller takes energy. So if you can do it in a clever fashion, you can have an immense reduction in the energy consumption. And if you think about it by implication, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, remember the energy used to break the rock, it's generated in the power station that throws the gases and stuff into the atmosphere. So it is, you know, in an indirect way of improving um, uh, the world's uh, energy. If you think about it, um, but 5% of the world's energy consumption is just in breaking of rocks, which is quite a substantial portion of world energy consumption. Um, so that is uh, just energy um, or breakage of uh, or liberation. Now, when you think about breaking a rock, there are a couple of forces that can be applied uh, to a rock to break it. Now, the first one and probably the one with the lowest uh, um, energy is a tensile. In actual fact, tensile versus a compressive breakage is a two to one uh, ratio. The one that should be mentioned with compression, and that is what uh, guys like Shinot and etc. found, um, is that, and that's where the HPGR came uh, out, H high pressure rolls crusher, is that they found with combination you create fissures that actually liberate the mineral species that you want. And that, an example of the use of HPRCs are in the diamond industry, and they use that for the final step of, of, of liberating the small diamonds. So, and it has been quite effective um, for the diamond industry. Then there's the impact breakage, if you think about it, just a, a high level impact uh, that you can use. And then there's the shear force, um, and then there is the attrition. And I uh, just need to mention that attrition is probably, if one thinks about it, I know a lot of people debate about all the forces and more, but it is mostly attrition and maybe some impact breakage that is occurring. But in, especially in a sag and an agmo, it's if you take a rock into a tall building and throw it down, it doesn't shatter into pieces. In actual fact, the, the rock just basically gets chipped away. So if you think about and if you go into a mall, um, the load of an agmo, you'll see the balls are all, all the, the rocks are all round, which is very indicative of actually an attrition mechanism. Now, what has happened over the years is there were various people that tried to get a, 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 a a relationship between um, energy and uh, particle size. And remember what I said, if you think about cognition breaking rocks, it really is all about energy. And the smaller the particles are, the more energy is um, consumed. Now, the oldest theory was this of, of Rittinger that he did here with energy consumption uh, versus um, uh, particle size, and then Kick did some work which is but Bond, which, who was, uh, worked at Alice Chalmers for many years, um, actually, in fact, he was the first to basically uh, build up a database of the relationship between the energy needed to break a rock into a certain size. And even today, if you, the calculations for the energy consumptions in mills and crushes is really based uh, fundamentally um, on um, Bond's work. And... Uh, you know, it's most basically as often is used as the, as the equations of um, Fred Bond. And uh, he developed this uh, equation here, which is the work index is the energy 
related to the product size and the feed particle size. So you can see there were, on the curve it was half, you know, halfway between Ritzinger and uh, Kick's work. And this equation is fundamentally used in industry a lot of um, the time uh, to calculate the energy consumption in a various combination uh, uh, steps. Now, having said that, spoken about combination and the mechanisms, I'm just going to cover um, broad application ranges of combination equipment. And there's very rare that you get a combination device that is going to do all the combination in one step for you. Now, the biggest of the machines and where they used to do the larger sizes would be typically a gyratory and a jaw crusher. And remember, these sizes that I'm indicating here at the bottom are indicative. Sometimes, depending on the ore and where you are and, and what happened before it uh, and, and downstream applications, some of these crushers and malls might be used in other uh, sizing applications like an ag mall sometimes can move and treat even larger rocks. So it's not fixated uh, just here. Then the next part, uh, typically after a, your primary crusher, which is gyratory crusher, you will do use a cone crusher, in some cases an impact crusher. The, um, the devices are most often used to get, uh, and are, then after crushing is getting the particle to about the 10 millimeter range, one then starts talking about um, uh, mills. Now, mills, um, uh, the most commonly used one is the, is the ag mill, but standing for autogenous mill, where it's really a big drum turning at a certain speed of uh, critical, and it's typically around about 80% of critical. Critical speed is basically if the drum turns too fast, the rock, rocks would stay on the roof of the um, of the mill, and it's very much like thinking of you, if you took a bucket and you swung it around like uh, over your head, the water would not fall out. It's, that's basically it's at that speed is the definition of critical speed. Then um, the next size uh, or, or mill is typically a rod mill, and the products, uh, and we used to mention all these commission devices, the products that come from them typically have a pretty wide side range and they're used in conjunction with uh, downstream classification uh, devices like a hydrocycle and be most common and, and screens to name another one. But this I'll deal with in another of my uh, videos. But a rod mill uses rods and, and in theory the reason it uses rods is to generate a lot fine, uh, sorry, a narrower size distribution of its um, product. And then you've got the ball mills typically used uh, to mull the, uh, the products uh, down uh, to a size where they can go for downstream uh, leaching and flotation processes. The um, HPGR is uh, used here um, at about the one millimeter and it's it's got a pretty wide range because it's really dependent on the size of the rolls that are used uh, to do the combination. Um, <clears throat> so, and as I said, um, the diamond industry in particular, they use these high pressure rolls, crushes to break up uh, the rocks without breaking the diamond because the diamond, the larger it is, is worth exponentially more. Just think of the ladies' rings. The bigger the diamond, the more she gets oohs and ahs from her friends. So the guy naturally wants to get to the nicer ring. Um, or the, with the one with the bigger diamonds, you do, do not want to break a big, big diamond into small bits. And that's the use of the HPGR. Then you get the Virtumol, in some cases called the Tamol. Essentially all it is, is a, you can see there's a, a top of an Archimedes uh, screw wheel there inside there. And you'll fill the, this chamber up with um, steel balls or, or balls of uh, ceramics. And basically it turns, so it's like a contact on contact with the um, steel balls uh, shape the, um, the, 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 the particles that you want to uh, communicate. And then you've got a stirred uh, ball mill, uh, which is very much the same mechanism, except in this one it's got a more like a, a flow from the top to the bottom, whereas this is really within a layer. And typically this is probably the generally used combination device that mills the slows. You've got the, also the ISO mill used in the platinum industry for fine grinding to recover the last bit of platinum. But this is typically the lowest range that you would go. And um, in metallurgy, it's rare that you would go finer than this because of the handleability in, uh, um, uh, of downstream processes to classify, as well as your viscosity problems typically. Um, so that's basically it. So this just gives you an idea of the broad range of um, the combination devices. I will be going into more detail in later videos on crushers and mills 
and how they fit into um, flow sheets in a generic uh, fashion.